The story you are about to hear takes place in 1973, one year after The Godfather and one year before Godfather II. It is a time of war in Vietnam, psychedelic drugs, and flower print miniskirts. A generation before the internet, cell phones, caller ID, and the gourmet coffee renaissance. Wednesday, August 22nd. It's a hot summer afternoon at LAPD's Parker Center. Within its air-conditioned corridors, a slick-talking senatorial candidate, Nelson Hayward, holds close to his wife, Victoria, as they make their way through a festive and busy mob of excited supporters, family, friends, police and bodyguards, political aides and reporters, all flooding the hallways of LAPD headquarters. Now come on, people. In county office, I gave them trouble on a local level for four straight years. As United States Senator, I'd be giving them twice as hard a time and on a national level to boot. Of course they're threatening my life. I'm threatening theirs. Uh, Mr. Hayward, sir. Uh, Rick yes. Stevens, UPI. Uh, yes. Sir, your request here today for police protection against the criminal... Oh, let me make myself clear. Yes. Watching from the far end of the hall, there's one detective who would like nothing better than to stay and enjoy the moment. But a toothache waits for no man. And the family dentist, Dr. Parencio, has agreed to stay late and see Detective Colombo on short notice. Colombo discreetly heads out to the parking lot as the wealthy and charismatic Nelson Hayward fields questions from reporters. And only at the continued insistence of concerned individuals. Sir, isn't that a rather cavalier attitude? Oh, I mean, it seems to me that anyone, much less a public official who's been receiving threatening letters... No, I will not be intimidated by these threats. I will continue the campaign. Meanwhile, back at Hayward for Senate campaign headquarters, a man and a woman sit in a rented office suite at the Western Grand Adventure Five Star Luxury Hotel. The two sit watching the news coverage on a small TV. Well, will you limit your public appearances? Not in the slightest. I believe that any candidate for high public office who has pledged himself, as have I, to the eradication of organized crime and all the filth that it engenders, had better possess whatever selfless dedication, whatever sheer guts may be required to stand alone, with his only protection being the courage of his convictions, regardless of uh, personal risk. This is what I believe, sir. Thomas Jefferson couldn't have said it better. Campaign manager Harry Stone beams, listening to the words he wrote flow effortlessly from the candidate's mouth. A type A personality trapped in the body of a grizzly bear, Harry Stone stands six feet tall and weighs 230 pounds. As usual, Harry's red power tie is loosened at the collar and his pale blue button-down shirt rolled up at the sleeves. The barrel-chested 52-year-old lights another cigarette. Sitting quietly on the couch holding a glass of water, Linda Johnson is far less enthused. Professional in appearance, the attractive 24-year-old's simple rose-colored dress complements her strawberry blonde hair, which she always wears up, revealing a small pearl stud on each ear. Her dual role affords Linda a unique perspective of the campaign. In addition to being the appointment secretary of Nelson Hayward's wife, Vicki, Linda Johnson also has the title of mistress to the candidate himself. So with the election less than a week away, Nelson Hayward, candidate for the U.S. Senate, in a race to fill the seat of the late Harold Lynch, will have round-the-clock police protection following the reported threats against his life. Watching the TV screen, Linda takes another drink from her glass. Her thoughtful green eyes reveal worry and she clicks the remote control, turning off the television. I think I just clinched your boyfriend's election. I can understand now why Nelson finds you repugnant. You know, you shouldn't have turned that off. I'm expecting a bulletin any minute. Like what? Like what senatorial candidate has been using his speech house to entertain his own wife's secretary? Nelson is not happily married. Look, I didn't tell you to come here to discuss his marriage. I told you to come here to discuss his affair with you. That's none of your business. Let go of him. It's time you call. Listen, Gomez, how about that endorsement? As Harry is put on hold, he covers the receiver and tells Linda, Let go now, Linda, today. I happen to be in love with him. If you were, you wouldn't risk ruining his chances. 
Listen, Gomez, we want that endorsement by noon tomorrow. Now say that Bleeding Hearts minority speech for those 3,000 creeps you control. Switching his attention back and forth, Harry glares at Linda as he yells into the phone at Gomez. Now if you like uh, heading that little sweetheart union of your... Hold on one second. Hey, use your head. He's going to be in here any minute surrounded by a cubby of cops, maybe newsmen. Now if you won't get out of town, at least get out of here. Your job's with the candidate's wife, not the candidate. All right, Harry, I will leave for now. But I won't stay away unless Nelson tells me to. You ought to know by now that Nelson does whatever I tell him to do. Well, I want to hear it from him. Have him call me. About 30 minutes after Linda leaves, candidate for Senate Nelson Hayward returns to campaign headquarters, slowly driving his dark blue four-door luxury sedan into the elite hotel's secure underground parking structure. A second car follows closely behind, four clean-cut men in jackets and ties, in fact, a plain-clothes LAPD SWAT team assigned to protect the candidate while campaigning in Los Angeles. Both four-door sedans park next to each other, and the five men exit their respective vehicles. Wearing his signature black pork pie hat and a camel hair sports coat, Nelson Hayward locks his car and, without waiting for security, the senatorial candidate heads for the elevator. The security detail's lead officer, Sergeant Nicholas Vernon, steps away from the other officers and catches up with Hayward just as he rings for the elevator. Uh, I'm leaving Sergeant Rojas down here to keep an eye on your car. Two months prior, campaign manager Harry Stone reserved a two-room suite with specific features and amenities. Room 615, the War Room, for monitoring media developments, writing speeches, scheduling interviews, and other critical activities. The adjoining room, 617, is Hayward's private bedroom with a smaller TV, a bed, and a work desk. Harry also reserved room 616 across the hall as the press room, six chairs, a couch, and two small TVs. Each room has a full bathroom, wet bar, closet, coffee pot, and outdoor patio. Nelson Hayward requires a three-way rotary phone system installed so that each phone clearly displays all three room extensions. At the hotel's sixth floor, they step off the elevator and Sergeant Vernon walks in front of Nelson as the two men make their way down the quiet hallway. Arriving at room 615, it's commonly referred to as the suite, Sergeant Vernon unlocks the door and without entering the room, he looks in to see Harry Stone sitting at his desk. The two men exchange a nod, and Vernon stands aside, allowing Hayward to enter. Still in the hallway, Sergeant Vernon tells Hayward, uh, I'll be standing by if you need anything, sir. Thank you, Sergeant. Entering the two-room suite, Nelson takes off his hat, and Harry Stone gets up from his desk with a newspaper in his hand. Any alliance between these two men is rooted purely in self-serving politics. In terms of ethics, they share nearly nothing in common. In terms of friendship, even less. How'd you go? Made all three networks. That's the greatest stunt I ever thought of. You know, all that garbage about your life being threatened really pulls the old sympathy. How was I? You'd have been better off without that reference to your guts. Ignoring the grumblings of his campaign manager, Humility, Nelson. Nelson Humility. steps into his private bedroom, the adjacent room number 617, mindful to leave the connecting door open so as not to appear suspicious. He puts his briefcase down on the bed and opens it. Glancing up to ensure Harry does not see him through the open door, Nelson goes to his closet and pulls out a charcoal gray overcoat. He reaches down into the lower left inside pocket and pulls out a 38 caliber revolver. From another pocket, he takes out a silencer, which he immediately screws snugly onto the end of the pistol's barrel. He conceals the weapon inside his briefcase's built-in file divider. On the desk phone, extension 615 illuminates, and from the other room, the resonant voice of Harry Stone is easily heard making his next phone call. Sitting at his desk, Nelson opens his lap drawer, shuffles through some paper, and takes out a dime store wristwatch with an imitation leather band. He stows it in his briefcase alongside the pistol. He closes and locks his briefcase and sets it down next to the bed. 
Exiting his bedroom, Nelson Hayward closes the door behind him. Bye bye. Just as Harry finishes his phone call. Here's your ecology speech for tomorrow morning. Nelson accepts the typed pages from Harry and begins reading as he walks over to the wet bar. Gillis did a terrific job on it, and I just improved it. Nelson puts down the speech face up so he can read while pouring himself a drink. Read it word for word and no ad libs, please. He takes a glass and notices something. Whose lipstick is this? Linda's. I asked her over. Guess why? To tell her to get out of my life. You guessed. Harry, stay out of my private life. You don't have any private life. I'm telling you. No, no I'm, I'm telling you. Sun. I put too much into getting you where you are now to take a chance on blowing it. Now, whatever affects your political life affects me. Linda Johnson's a political liability. Harry, I need her. You don't need anybody but me. You can get rid of anybody but me because I know where the bodies are buried, Nels. I buried them for you. Now, that's why I'm calling this shot. She's out. Not just until after the election. You're going to be a happily married senator. Linda's out, period. Staring straight at Harry Stone, Nelson Hayward's mouth slowly contorts into an eerie smile, but his eyes remain bitter and impatient. You don't leave me any choice, as usual. Well, let me call her. Hayward walks over to the phone, picks up the receiver, and dials the number to his mistress, Linda Johnson. With his back to Harry, Nelson Hayward stands over the phone and, using his body to block Harry's view, the candidate discreetly hangs up the call. Glancing down to ensure the phone extension's light goes off, Nelson begins improvising to an empty phone line. Linda, it's me. Honey, I've got to see you. No, not here at your place. Her place? Harry panics but uh, bites his tongue understand. as Hayward, still holding down in the telephone's cradle, continues Linda? his monologue. Uh, give me about 30 minutes. Bye. To campaign manager Harry Stone, this is political suicide. God's sake, Nels, are you going to take a police escort to her place? You want headlines about my wife's secretary taking an overdose of sleeping pills? Now let me break it to her, gently, personally. How is Nelson Hayward going to drive to his girlfriend's apartment without the protection detail? Referring to the lead officer just outside in the hallway, Harry Stone asks, What about that cop out there? Nelson stops to think for a moment. Then his eyes spark with an idea. Opening the door to their suite, Nelson Hayward summons Sergeant Vernon. Oh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Sergeant, uh, I wonder if I can speak with you for a minute. Yes, sir. Uh, not many people know this, but I smoke cigars. Now, this may sound trivial to you, but unfortunately, cigars are rather bad for the political image, so to speak. The old smoke-filled room cliché. Yes, anyway, Still not fully clear on what his candidate is up to. Harry Stone watches from inside the suite, quietly listening as Nelson Hayward smooth talks Sergeant Vernon. Anyway, uh, there are invariably reporters in the lobby of this place, so uh, I was wondering if maybe you could uh, go down to the cigar counter and uh, pick me up a box of Panatellas. Oh, no problem. Except, Mr. Hayward, I, I really shouldn't be leaving your room unguarded. Oh, I think Mr. Stone and I can fight them off together for a few minutes. <laughs> yes, sir. Sergeant Vernon goes down to the lobby, and Nelson Hayward shuts the door and quickly takes off his jacket. Is he the only one? No, there's a couple more down in the garage. Harry, give me your jacket. What? Harry, this is very important to me. Else, this is crazy. Please, you've had everything your way. Just let me have this much. Give me a jacket. Reluctantly, Harry complies, and the two men exchange jackets. There is a considerable difference in size, and in Harry Stone's dark gray sport blazer, Nelson feels like he's wearing a trench coat with extra long sleeves. Meanwhile, Harry Stone squeezes into Nelson's custom-tailored jacket. It's a tight fit, but it's on, and Harry figures if he can move his arms, it'll work. Finally, Nelson Hayward hands Harry Stone his signature black pork pie hat, and Harry puts that on too, completing his ad hoc disguise as the candidate for senator. To Harry's surprise, he's beginning to enjoy this small deception. A bit of spontaneity, and this little disappearing act could be good publicity. The maverick individual who sometimes needs to break free, go off on his own, connect with the earth or something. Hayward, his own man. Each man grabs his own briefcase, and they hurriedly take the elevator downstairs to the dimly lit parking garage. Silently, 
the two men exchange car keys, and Nelson gives Harry an envelope. Get in the car. Drive right out of here. Drop the car off at the beach house and call yourself a cab. Campaign manager Harry Stone is able to secretly get to Nelson's blue four-door completely unnoticed. Sitting in the driver's seat, Harry Stone quietly puts the keys in the ignition and methodically thinks through the next few motions. Harry takes a deep breath, starts the engine, slams the car door, and peels out. Wearing the candidate's signature hat and jacket, Harry Stone drives Nelson's blue four-door directly to the exit farthest away from the cops. Police scramble to get to their car and give chase, but they're too late. And by the time they fly out of the garage and get to Sunset Boulevard, their candidate, Nelson Hayward, is nowhere to be seen. They drive to Nelson's home, but he's not there either. They've completely lost him. Meanwhile, now completely alone in the parking garage, Nelson Hayward quietly gets into his campaign manager's car, and, with a loaded gun in his briefcase, he drives out of the parking garage and quickly gets on PCH North. About an hour later, Harry Stone is driving Nelson's car through an empty stretch of road about 100 feet from the beach. Mostly keeping his eyes on the road, he steals little glances of the crashing waves. Nothing around for miles except for one gas station which appears to be closing. Glancing at his fuel gauge, he's relieved to see he's still got over half a tank. Finally, Harry arrives at the beach house. He presses the remote control and waits as the garage door opens. Still wearing Nelson's camel hair sport coat with his black pork pie hat sitting on the passenger seat next to him, he pulls the car into the garage, turns off the engine and the headlights, then sets the parking brake. He grabs Nelson's hat, exits the vehicle, and shuts and locks the car. He leaves the garage door open because there's a street light outside, but tonight it's broken. Kids throwing rocks, maybe. So it's much darker than usual, making it nearly impossible to see his way. Careful with each step, he makes his way through the shadows of the left side of the garage, trying to find either a light switch or the door connecting the garage to the main house. Suddenly the light comes on in the garage. Harry spins on his heels to see Nelson Hayward standing on the passenger side of the garage with his finger on the light switch. So that's where the switch is, the right side of the garage. Harry's baffled, and Nelson again with that same weird contorted smile, and he's holding something in his right hand, what? But before Harry can ask... Nelson slowly walks over to the body of Harry Stone. A stream of blood oozes from his nose as he lays dying on the floor of Hayward's garage. The politician crouches to watch very closely as the once domineering Stone takes his last precious breaths. Harry's skin is beaded with sweat. A moment passes, and it's very obvious Harry is dead. With gloved hands, Nelson grabs Stone's left wrist and loosens the band of his large stainless steel wristwatch, which currently shows the correct time as 8.10 p.m. He removes it from Harry's wrist and just looks at it for a moment. The first word that comes to mind is, heavy. Holding it in his right hand, it feels like a paperweight, which in a way it is. One of those watches you could probably shoot and it would keep on ticking. Making a mental note to get rid of it before he gets home, Hayward stows the watch in the breast pocket of his jacket, actually Harry's jacket, which they traded earlier. He takes out the smaller, more fragile wristwatch, which he removed from his desk drawer about an hour ago. Nelson thinks to himself, less is more. He winds it to the time of 9.20 p.m., a little over an hour ahead, and straps the timepiece to Harry Stone's left wrist. Holding the lifeless forearm, Nelson slams it violently against the garage's concrete floor. Twice. Three times. He checks to ensure the watch is broken, its glass face in pieces. Nelson listens for a ticking and hears nothing. The watch is stuck at 9.20. The night is young, and Nelson's next task is also not to be found in the appointment calendar of Harry Stone. Nelson Hayward stands up, takes one last look around,
then walks outside behind the beach house, gets back into Harry Stone's car and hits the road, making the half-hour drive back to his West L.A. mansion in about 20 minutes. Pulling into his driveway, Nelson Hayward turns off the headlights before bringing Harry's car to a stop and setting the parking brake. He gets out and walks halfway around the side of his sprawling two-story mansion when he spots a man hiding in the bushes about 50 feet away. Hayward signals. The man steps out of the shadows, walks up to the candidate, and the two exchange a familiar nod of recognition. Clearly acting in concert, but without saying a word, the two men stealthily enter the Hayward house through the nearest side door entrance when they hear music coming from a distant part of the house. Once inside, Hayward, still wearing the sport coat of his first victim, quietly heads for the family room adjacent to the kitchen, while his accomplice makes his way toward the enormous living room, which comprises the front half of the house. Each man avoids touching anything, turning on lights, or making any noise. Meanwhile, unaware of the two men walking through her house, Vicki Hayward is halfway through her second screwdriver. Or maybe this is her third. They are very small drinks. Curled up on the family room sofa, she takes a sip, leans her head back, and enjoys the pleasant warmth in her cheeks. More and more, this is becoming Vicky's nightly ritual. A pleasant, quiet time to herself while her husband works late at the office. In any event, this is happy hour, and there does seem to be a problem with Vicky's glass. Thinking the maid is the only other person in this large house, Vicky calls out, Juanita? Juanita! Getting no answer, Vicky picks up her empty glass, walks over to the stereo, and turns off the music. She leaves the family room, rounds the foot of the grand staircase, and walks into the library, which hosts, among other things, a wet bar. She steps into the bar well, and from a mini refrigerator beneath the counter, Vicky takes the orange juice in one hand and the vodka in the other. At this exact moment, Nelson's accomplice is waiting silently in the Hayward living room. Nelson enters the family room and turns off the light where his wife had just been sitting. At the bar, Vicky sees the light go off in the other room, but thinks little of it. Probably Juanita. Having poured another drink, Vicky returns to the family room and notices all the other lights in the house are now off. Vicky makes her way through the darkness, heading toward the living room where Nelson's confederate is lying in wait. Walking on thick carpet, she is oblivious of Nelson secretly walking up behind her. With his bare hands, Nelson blindfolds Vicky as his confederate in the living room turns on the lights. Surprise! And about a dozen good friends pour into the living room, helping Vicky celebrate her 45th birthday. Despite the judges and doctors, dinner coats and evening gowns, the group's festivity is about as formal as a circus act. Everyone's having a good time, and Nelson Hayward spins his yarn to 20 of his most influential friends. I'm wearing my hat and my jacket, zipping out of the garage in my car. For all I know, they're still following old Harry all over the streets. Now there's a switch. Imagine a husband going through all that just to be with his wife. That's a switch. Well, you, you run for office someday, and you'll see how much privacy you get. Nelson's discreet sleight of hand goes unnoticed, or at least unmentioned, when he quickly takes away Vicky's drink, replacing it with a crab cake. No, darling, here, right this way. Not on Vicky's birthday. Wait, we are having no press, no police, not even outside the house. All right, my dear. And as for you, my dear friends, I can promise all of you that at the propitious moment, we shall throw the entire pack of you right out of here. With the utmost courtesy. According to the grandfather clock near the doorway, it's currently 9.22 p.m. The distinguished statesman gets up from his chair. And because you are our dear friends and in honor of the occasion, will you excuse me just a moment? <laughs> Smiling graciously, Nelson walks out of the dining room, passes the grand staircase, and enters the library where there's a private telephone in the far corner of the room. Quietly, he lifts the receiver, covers the mouthpiece with a handkerchief, and dialing the number from memory, he places an anonymous phone call to LAPD's downtown LA station, Parker Center. Disguising his voice, he tells the police operator, Just wanted to let you know we keep our promises. You're worried about Nelson Hayward. You'll find what's left of him in the garage of his beach house. 
he hangs up the phone and crosses the length of the office. He approaches the bar, opens a glass cabinet, and carefully removes three bottles of prized brandy. He places all three bottles into a wicker basket and returns to the dining room to join his guests. Ladies and gentlemen, for after dinner, brandy, 1893. Oh! I was saving this to toast my election to the Senate, but I'm afraid not even that could bring me as much pleasure as I'm having this evening. Oh, to Victoria. To Victoria. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. At a dental clinic in Santa Monica, an office radio plays the opera Rigoletto. Lieutenant Colombo sits in a dentist chair as Dr. Mario Parencio works diligently to identify the source of the detective's toothache and ultimately alleviate his patient's pain. Colombo is holding his mouth wide open and there's a suction tube hanging from his cheek. Tooth by tooth, Parencio uses his metal instruments to push and prod as he checks for cavities and other problems. Despite Colombo's mouth being full of dental equipment, Dr. Parencio enjoys a good talk while he works. You're Italian, Lieutenant. I'm Italian. Cavelli is Italian. You're a cop. I'm a dentist. Cavelli is a tenant. None of us is mafia. You know any Italians are mafia? Any Italians in your family mafia? No. Any Italians on the police force mafia? Nah, when people talk about the Italians, do they think cops? Dentists, tennis, the Pope not even. The Pope is Italian, ain't he? Ah. They think, they think mafiosa, mafiosa, mafiosa. Ah. The tall dentist sprays compressed air into the patient's yes. wide open mouth before putting a paper cup full of water in his hand. Thanks, Doc. Right. Parencio steps out of the room for just a moment. The dentist returns, carrying a small set of x-rays. Here's the x-rays. Mm. He holds one x-ray up to the light so both men can see the cloudy black and white image of Columbo's teeth and gums. What? It's too bad. What's too bad? What do you mean, too bad? You mean too bad T-W-O or too bad T-O-O? What are you saying? No. I don't know what you're saying, two or two. When you say too bad, you mean too bad like... Too bad it's a rainy day, or too bad that there are two to the bed. It's too bad. The wisdom tooth's got to come out, and the molar, we can save it with a temporary. We interrupt operatic interludes for a special news bulletin. We have just received an unconfirmed report that Nelson Hayward, candidate for United States Senator from California, uh, has uh, just been uh, shot uh, and killed uh, in a garage... Columbo sits Beach up quickly. Road. It is understood that Hayward eluded a police escort that had been assigned to him after numerous recent threats on his life. No arrests have been made yet, but we'll keep you advised as reports reach our newsroom. Nelson, eh? Yeah, try to pin it on the mafia. Don't let him do it, Lieutenant. I just saw this man a little while ago. Hey, I gotta call my wife. I gotta get you out of here. You can't leave here without a temporary in that mall. All right, Doc, but make it fast. <coughs> Nelson, hey, I'll tell you something else, Lieutenant. You are an Italian cop. And no matter who you catch for that murder, they're still going to say it's the Mafia and that you're covering for them. Come on, Doc. Open wide. Take my advice, Lieutenant. Change your name. And don't bite down on anything hard. Parencio puts in the temporary in record time and lets the detective use his office phone to call LAPD. Talking to the dispatcher, Columbo learns Hayward's beach house is about a 10-minute drive up PCH, and Columbo is officially assigned to the case. Just before heading out, the lieutenant puts in one last call to Mrs. Columbo, but she's not home yet, so he gets behind the wheel of his Peugeot 403 convertible and drives to Nelson Hayward's secluded beach house. This late at night, it's difficult to make out street addresses, but the uniforms have already yellow-taped the beach house, declaring it a crime scene. So all Columbo has to do is just drive towards all the red and white flashing lights. There's very little traffic, and Columbo makes it in good time, arriving just a few minutes before 10. Three police officers stand guard at the yellow-taped perimeter, but the real party seems to be inside the garage. 
Exiting his vehicle with a cigar in hand, Columbo bums a match from one of the officers. Give me a minute. Murder's always depressing, but you get over. Candidate for the U.S. Senate. Here you are, Lieutenant. Doesn't make any difference what party, black or white. Tax the wind out of you. Before walking to the garage, Columbo looks up and notices the broken street light, its shattered glass dark against the night sky. The police officer with the matches asks Columbo, Something I can do for you, Lieutenant? No, just... You see, the street light is broken. I bet the kids did that. I remember that's what we used to do. Throw rocks, break the street light. Columbo goes into the garage the crime scene, and the first thing he sees is Nelson Hayward's blue four-door luxury sedan parked with all four windows rolled up. As expected, a busy scene of two more uniformed cops, latents and forensic techs, ballistics, the coroner, the photographer, and of course, the dead body lying about five feet from the driver's door. And because this was a political target, Deputy Commissioner Regis Kordick is on the scene, getting a preliminary briefing from another detective, Lieutenant Angelo Grisanti. Now these items were in his pants pocket, evening commissioner. Your late lieutenant. Now in Hayward's pocket, that's in his camel hair coat pocket. There was also a pack of gum, same brand and a handkerchief. But that's understandable, because what were in the pants belonged to the guy and what were in the coat were Hayward's. That's all we found. <laughs> In conclusion, Grisanti nods to Deputy Commissioner Kordick, closes his notebook, and returns to the left side of the garage, where the body of homicide victim Harry Stone is being swept for forensic evidence. The Deputy Commissioner turns to Columbo. Lieutenant Columbo, stay here, I want to talk to you. Charlie? Yes, sir. Charlie, what's the corner, sir? Still standing next to Officer Davis, Columbo says... Sir. What was he talking about? Who? A detective. Uh, uh, I don't know. I wasn't listening. Attributed to three gunshot wounds, two of which slugs appear still lodged in the upper abdomen. Excuse me. Be right back. Columbo walks over to the left side of the garage, where Detective Grisanti is standing over the deceased and writing in his notepad. Listen, man. What, what did you mean over there before when you said about the? It was understandable about the stuff being in Hayward's coat and pants. I never mentioned Hayward's pants. The wallet and the key were in Stone's pants. Who's Stone? You're kidding. No. Stone is the victim. Not Hayward? Oh, no, no, Lieutenant. That's what we originally thought until we found It's him. not Hayward? Oh, boy. Columbo pats the hood of the car with aha revelation. What a relief. Holy Christmas. I just found out it wasn't Hayward. I already called my wife to break the news. She loves Haywood. I didn't want her to hear it on TV. Grisanti smiles. You better call it back. Well, thank goodness she wasn't home. Who's Stone? Stone is the campaign manager. A case of mistaken identity. Columbo doesn't mouth the words, but Grisanti can read his colleague's face. Well, I'll be a son of a gun. Columbo returns to the huddle, where Commissioner Kordick is being briefed, this time by Detective Lou Brown. We got any fingerprints? The boys are still dusting the garage, but they haven't come up with anything yet. Anybody see anything unusual? No, sir, no one. Have we been able to establish an exact time of the death? Yeah, that looks like 9.20 p.m. The broken watch crystal on the wrist of the deceased would fix the time. Coroner confirmed that? No, he hasn't confirmed it, but he feels that's about right. He'll give us a full confirmation by noon tomorrow. No, no, tell him tomorrow morning is not good enough. Tell him I want it tonight. Now, I may want to make an official report to the press tomorrow, so I want it by What the time do you have? Whatever he has to do, but... 10 o'clock. That's what I got. I want to get this for sure, right? He says to Commissioner Cordick... Excuse me, I'll be right back. Oh, before I forget, where is he going this time? Columbo walks to the front of Nelson Hayward's car and feels the hood. He then bends down and feels the car's wheels. Noticing Detective Grisanti examining the victim's wristwatch, Columbo walks over and asks, Right, see that? He inspects the small broken timepiece, forever showing the current time as 9.20. The glass cover, broken but still in place. A cheap wind-up wristwatch, small, flimsy, with a fake leather band. 
Lieutenant, I want you to hear this. He gives the watch back to Crisanti. Columbo takes one last look and returns to Commissioner Cordic, who is now being briefed by Sergeant Vernon and Sergeant Rojas from the plainclothes security detail assigned to protect Nelson Hayward. The killer was waiting right outside the hotel garage. When he saw Stone drive off in Hayward's car here, there was no security around, so he took advantage of the situation and he followed him here. And he killed him. That must have been what happened, sir, because you see, I tried to follow the car, and uh, well, I lost it very soon afterwards at the three way intersection. I took sense of thinking he might be going to his house, but I was wrong. That had to be it, sir, because that was the first time that Hayward, or somebody who appeared to be Hayward, was out of our sight. The first and only time, and what happens? He winds up dead. Does anybody have any idea? We haven't been able to locate him yet. Columbo asks Officer Davis, Who was the first guy on the scene? Uh, Miller. How much does the press know about it so far? Oh, just that Stone's dead, that's all. Uh, Excuse me, sir, I'll be right back. I don't want to. Bella? Yes. Bella? Yes. You were the first guy on the scene? Right. Was the light on? No. Where's the light switch? Gee, Lieutenant, I don't know. Sorry. Columbo looks around for the light switch takes him a moment, then he's surprised to see the light switch on the right side of the garage. Odd place for a garage light switch, opposite from the driver's side. Hmm. Hypnotized by his notepad, Columbo is lost in thought. Okay, Bernard, let's hear your version. Lieutenant, I want you to hear this. He absently holds up one hand. Just a minute. He watches the body of Harry Stone being loaded into the coroner's station wagon. After all, what if he went out through the main lobby and not the garage? I don't care if they've all left and gone home to bed. Columbo says to Officer Miller, Tell him I'll be right back. Hey! Hey! Hold Hey! Hey! He runs out and asks the driver to wait. Columbo jumps in through the back of the station wagon and looks closely at Harry Stone's clothes. He feels the material, looks closely at the shirt collar, looks at Harry Stone's hands. He then drops down and carefully looks at each shoe, heel to toe, top and bottom. Lieutenant, where the hell is he? Coming, sir! He then climbs out of the station wagon, closes its door, and runs back in to meet with Commissioner Cordy. You keep disappearing. Where were you? Would you send my car, please? Lieutenant. Look, if it was Hayward that was killed, naturally I would head up this investigation. But it wasn't. It was Stone. So right now I'm more concerned with Hayward's future than that nothing happens to him. So I'm going to concentrate on his security. It'll be your job to locate this lunatic or whoever he is. Yes. Is that my car? Meeting concluded. Cordick is whisked away by his driver. Sergeant Vernon from Hayward's protection detail excitedly approaches Columbo. Lieutenant! Lieutenant Columbo, we finally located Hayward. He's at home. Took him a long time to locate him at home. Yes, sir. Well, we called earlier, but the maid kept insisting he wasn't there. But I just now called, I got a hold of his wife. He's there, all right. There's some kind of party. Did I know about this? Oh, oh, no, sir. I figured that you'd want to make the official visit. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I better. Uh, excuse me, sir. Columbo makes a few more notes, touches base with forensics, then drives over to Nelson Hayward's enormous mansion. About an hour later, Vicki Hayward's birthday party is in full swing. Everyone's happy and having a good time. Vicky is requesting a song from a woman playing the piano. The maid whispers in her boss's ear, and Vicky says something friendly to the woman, excuses herself, and makes a beeline straight for the back door. She puts her drink down on the counter and opens the door to find a short man in need of a haircut and a new raincoat. Yes, can I help you? Uh, Lieutenant Columbo, man, police. I'd like to speak to Mr. Hayward. Oh, no need for concern. Pleasantly blocking the door as she speaks, Vicky declines to invite this man into her home. It's perfectly safe. Thank you. 
Yes, ma'am, I, I know, uh, but I'd like to speak to you. This is important, I'd like to speak to you. Oh, I know it's important, but we're having a private party. It's my birthday. Oh. Uh, so why don't you just go around in the back and have yourself a piece of cake? The maid will fix you a hot cup of coffee and a piece of cake. Well, thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate that, but... Look, I don't be so serious. Go have a piece of cake. Really, it's delicious. She closes the door, but Colombo gently Sorry. keeps it open. Yeah. It can't wait. What's your name? Columbo. Annoyed, Vicky takes Columbo by the hand, as she would a little lost boy, and leads him into the living room where Nels is talking to one of his friends about security. Vicky introduces the detective. This is Lieutenant Columbo, the police. Oh? Huh? Couldn't wait. Lieutenant? Hey, you trapped me in my lair, eh? <laughs> Sorry to disturb your party. Oh, no, no, no. It's I who should apologize to you, fellas. After all, avoiding your compatriots like that, I'm sorry, but it's my wife's birthday and I'd planned this little surprise, you see. I'll call the commissioner's office in the morning and apologize and get those other detectives off the hook as well, huh? Why don't you fix yourself a drink, make yourself at home, take your coat off. Hayward gives Columbo an attaboy pat on the back, turns around and resumes his conversation. This, uh, this security problem really gets to be an aggravation. Columbo oh, politely well, insists. They, they Excuse me, me, Mr. Hayward. Yes? If I could have a moment with you privately, it's uh, rather serious, I'm afraid. Oh, it is? Well, dear, I guess uh, the old clothing switch is a felony. He's probably going to tell us Harry and I are guilty of aggravated police avoidance, huh? <laughs> no, sir, nothing like that, no. Uh... <laughs> Excuse me. The two men walk over to a corner, and out of respect, the detective lowers his voice as he speaks. I'm from homicide. Well, you're a little premature, Lieutenant. They haven't got me yet. Uh, yes, sir, I know, uh, and we're mighty grateful for that. Uh, but there has been a homicide. There has been a homicide. Yes, sir. There, uh, Mr. Stone, your campaign manager, he's dead. Harry Stone is dead. Everything stops. You can hear a pin drop, and the guests wordlessly gather around Hayward and Columbo. What's the matter? Vicky. What? What? Harry Stone is dead. What? How? 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 Where? At your beach house, sir, in the garage. Oh, no. Shot. Murdered. Oh, no. Harry's oh, it's gone. impossible. Honey. Nelson sits down on the couch and reverently touches Harry's jacket. That's all that she has to do. We can't believe that. Someone says something about giving Nels and Vicky their privacy. Uh, under the circumstances, I, I'm sure you understand. Yes. Oh, yes. Could we just say good night? Oh, of course. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. It's so sweet to bring the gifts and all that. As guests collect their coats and say their good nights, Nelson Hayward is still on the couch, holding Harry's coat mournfully. Columbo asks Hayward about Harry's impersonating him when he was shot. He was wearing some of your clothes driving your car. And apparently somebody thought he was you. Shot him. I pull a sophomoric prank and poor Harry is... Did you know, sir, that uh, he was going out to your beach house? Yes. I told him to spend the night there. All I can say, sir, is whoever did it will get him. He wasn't just a campaign manager. He was a... Hayward Nelson dramatically clutches Harry's jacket. A very close personal friend. Shocked, Vicky's jaw drops. Then the wife of the future senator regains her stately composure. Oh, leave me alone. Please, leave me alone. Nelson gets up and walks off, and Columbo gives the man his space. Maybe Vicky Hayward is more willing to talk. <laughs> Good night, Leon Goldie. Good night. We'll be near if you need us. Forming an orderly line to the front door, the wealthy dinner guests offer Vicky their condolences as they gradually depart for the evening. Call us, will you? I'll call you tomorrow, darling. Okay. Columbo waits his turn behind the last couple who are now saying goodnight to Vicky. If there's anything we can do for you, anything at all, yes. just call us. I will, honey. Okay. The couple take their leave, and Columbo discreetly says to Vicky, I, uh, just for the purposes of my report, uh, could you tell me what time the party started? Uh, it was 
I don't know. Well, I don't Bill know. told us to all be there at 8.30 out and back so we could come in with him when he came home. The surprise bitch, you know. Yes, it was around 8.30. <laughs> at 8.30 he came and we all came in, that's all. Good night, Luce. Good night, George. Uh, ma'am, um... Uh, you know, whoever uh, made this threat on your husband's wife, he's going to know that he didn't make good on that threat. So we're going to have a man posted out here tonight just just to do everything possible uh, to... Uh... Okay, good. After everyone's gone for the night, Vicky's curled up on the couch, this time in Nelson's office. She gazes into her drink and enjoys the feel and smell of the deeply cushioned leather upholstery. When her husband walks in wearing his house robe, Vicky throws back her head and erupts in mock surprise. Oh, don't tell me. A little thing like Harry's getting murdered is enough to make you sleep at home tonight. No, I forgot. Police guard outside. Can't step out tonight, can you? <laughs> Vicky, let's don't go at each other again. Not tonight. Come on. No. Come on. Let's not. <laughs> Out of respect for poor dead Harry, <laughs> you know. Nelson walks up, <laughs> takes the woman by her hand, and gently pulls her to her feet. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Vicky walks to the bar and continues speaking as she pours herself another drink. Besides, I wouldn't want to see you dissemble before my very eyes again. Your display of grief is overpowering. Well, in spite of everything, the man had been with me for a very long time. True. Come on, let's go to bed. Is that invitation social? <laughs> or just a professional courtesy? <laughs> I wish you wouldn't drink so much. It's what I do best. Besides, it's something that uh, you don't need a steady partner. She returns to the couch, sits down, turning her back to Nelson. All right, come on, Vicky. It's getting late. Now we're going to bed. Sometimes you frighten me. What are you talking about? That act you put on. Act? Mm -hmm. When you heard about Harry's being dead. I was shocked. Yeah. That's what frightens me. You were so convincing. I, mean, I know how you despised him. He comes over and sits with her. Well, it's a political game I've been playing for so many years, too, Vicky. After a while, you react the way people expect you to, not as you really feel. And hey, maybe I was feeling a little for myself. I mean, that bullet was meant for me. I'm sorry, of course. It's just that sometimes I feel like you're playing that game with me. I tell you, what if I filed for divorce now? Before the election. Oh, that'd sober us both pretty good, wouldn't it? Now, wait a minute, Vicky. Listen to me. Listen to me. Mm -hmm. I want you to believe I'm sorry for the things that have come between us. There is no other woman in my life, but yes, I do want to be senator. But never did I ever want to lose you. I never wanted that. I wish you could believe me. A beat. Then Vicky does believe him, at least for the moment. Still holding her glass, she collapses into his oh, arms. I... Oh. Hey, I know what. Excitedly, Nelson oh. pulls his head back so he can look oh. Vicky in the eye. What? I've got a three-day whistle-stop tour coming up. Why don't you come with me? We'll campaign together like old times. I can't. Yes. I hate all those crowds. No, you don't, and they love you. I come on. Do. Come on. Oh, listen, and then I have to stay alone all the no, time in the hotel. No, much. Come on. Wait, come on. You, you no. work all the no, time. No, no, take, take that appointment secretary that Harry got you. Uh, what's her name? Linda? Yes, bring her along. And with that, the couple turns off the light and goes to bed. The following morning, Colombo drives to the Western Grand Adventure Five Star Luxury Hotel, the temporary headquarters of Hayward for Senate. The detective parks his car at the curb, sets the parking brake, and exits the vehicle carrying a newspaper and a manila envelope. He walks into the hotel's grand ballroom to find 20 to 30 campaign volunteers eagerly doing everything they can to ensure Hayward's victory in the race for Senate. Large cardboard signs with a man's face over hot button catchphrases, banners and flags, clipboards and typewriters, 
everything powered by enthusiasm, hope, and admiration. On the far side of the spacious ballroom, he spots a door marked Private Nelson Hayward, with a secretary's desk immediately outside the door. Approaching the secretary, Columbo asks if he can speak with Hayward for a few minutes. Identified by her paper name tag, Helen is Hayward's no-nonsense gatekeeper, who says Mr. Hayward's not in right now, but she expects him in at any moment, and she invites Columbo to have a seat while he waits. So the lieutenant takes a seat and opens his newspaper. The headline jumps off the page. Hayward enjoys six-point lead in the polls. Just as the detective begins to read the article, Man of the Hour, Nelson Hayward, seems to hold the world in his hand. And by all appearances, the world loves it. Joining in on the excitement, Columbo applauds too, watching Nelson Hayward enter the room flanked by his loyal entourage. Bodyguard Sergeant Vernon, in his usual position in front of Nelson Hayward, and on Nelson's right arm, his beloved wife, Vicky. Picking up the rear, carrying boxes of reports and data charts, a few more supporters, one of whom is Vicki Hayward's secretary, Linda Johnson. Holding Vicki on his right arm, Nelson Hayward asks Sergeant Vernon to ensure his wife's safe travel home. Sergeant, I'd like you to be sure my little lady gets home safely and all that luggage is limited. We'll take care of it, sir. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, Setting his travel schedule, Hayward nonchalantly tells Vicky's secretary to retrieve a copy from the office. Uh, Linda, Miss Johnson, you got a copy of my itinerary. You better pick one up right away, dear. An attractive woman in her 20s, Linda leaves the Hayward entourage, passes Columbo, and walks straight to the candidate's office. Opening the door, she looks back in time to see Nelson kiss his wife. Goodbye, darling. I'll see you home. Huh? Linda enters the office, closing the door behind her. Meanwhile, the candidate glad hands and schmoozes as many supporters as he can get his hands on. As he slowly nears Columbo, the two men make eye contact, and Columbo stands. Hey, Lieutenant, glad to see you. Mr. Hayward. Columbo extends his hand, and Hayward pumps it excitedly. Sure, sure. Columbo gestures to the newspaper. So the latest poll is you're doing terrific. Thank you, thank you very much. You uh, you are voting in this one, aren't you? Sure. Oh, I vote. Every election I vote. In our house, you gotta vote. Very sacred thing. Hayward approaches the secretary's desk, and Helen instinctively puts four or five message slips in his hand. We sit around the kitchen table, we discuss, and we vote. Hayward continues talking to Columbo as he reads the slips of paper. Uh -huh. Then you made up your mind about the candidates in this election. Well, you don't have to worry about my wife, sir. She's crazy about you. And you? Uh, well, I'm still a little bit on the fence, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, well, we're just going to have to put you on the undecided list, I guess. Nelson Hayward opens his office door, then turns to Columbo. Oh, did you want to see me about anything special? Uh, oh, no, sir. Uh, nothing. I mean, it can wait whenever you get Oh, fine, fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll see you in a bit. As Hayward disappears into his office, Sergeant Vernon, of his protection detail, walks up to Columbo. Lieutenant, you got something new on the stone desk? Uh, no, nothing concrete, Sergeant. Waiting to speak with Hayward, Columbo hangs out with Sergeant Vernon at the campaign headquarters. Listening more than they speak, the two detectives linger within earshot of Nelson Hayward's secretary and his office door. Columbo takes in his surroundings. In another part of the floor, he sees a tall guy with blonde, wavy hair and a pimply face handing a flat box to an Asian woman. She opens the empty box, smiles at the blonde guy, and nods gratefully. In another area, a heavy-set kid with a loud tie is pouring coffee. Two black women are pointing at the top left corner of a campaign poster. Meanwhile, the door marked Private Nelson Hayward keeps its promise affording Nelson Hayward and his mistress, Linda Johnson, a few moments of forbidden pleasure. Lustful intent and electric hands set the two lovers on fire. Still locked passionately in each other's embrace, Linda suspends her kissing for a moment. Her cheeks are flush, Nelson's voice a soft purr. Don't be nervous, the door is locked. I can't help it. I missed you. It's not easy being around your wife all the time. I know, I know. It's been very difficult for you. It has been for me, too. And with primal urgency, Nelson pulls her closer against his body. They're going to wonder what's going on in here. I have a very busy itinerary. <laughs> I worry about you. How's that? 
Or the murder. Oh, I'm well protected. I'm overprotected. I still worry. That's nice. You know, Harry was right about one thing. I shouldn't see you until election day is over. And anyway, it's just a few days. Mm -hmm. The two returned their kissing. Right outside the door, Columbo, still wearing his raincoat, sits in the chair reading his newspaper. Without taking his face away from the newspaper, Columbo spots a sharp-dressed man wearing a bow tie, carrying a beige sport coat on a hanger wrapped in plastic. At first glance, it looks identical to the jacket Harry Stone was wearing when he was murdered at the Hayward Beach House. The man in the bow tie approaches Helen's desk, presents the jacket, and says, For well, Mr. Hayward. I'll sign for it. I'm supposed to deliver it to him in person. He's in conference. He may be a while. She signs for it in his receipt book. Okay. I'll take that. Thank you. The man relinquishes the jacket and departs. Helen carries it over to a coat rack, hangs it, and returns to her desk. Columbo's about to take a closer look when Hayward's door opens and Linda Johnson exits. She sees Columbo but continues walking, and in less than a minute, Linda is exiting the building. The door opens again, this time Nelson Hayward. Be right with you, Lieutenant. Hayward walks over to Helen's desk. All right, Helen. What else have we got? Lunch at 12 with Judge Forsberg. The Hadassah has been pushed back to 3, and you have a staff... All right, all right. I'm sorry I asked. He looks at Columbo and makes a sweeping gesture toward his office. Come on, Lieutenant. Come on. The two men walk into Nelson's private office. What's new on the murder? I've been following the papers. I called your commissioner's office from Fresno. But uh, what's being done, Lieutenant? Sitting on a chair in front of his desk. Sit down, sit down. Nelson Hayward puts his feet up. So far, sir, we don't have a thing. Well, that's hard, me. Officially, that is. And unofficially? Unofficially, we don't have anything either. Well, I don't understand. That I mean, is, this... the department does. Now, me personally, and believe me, sir, that is extremely unofficial. I want you to understand that. Would you get to the point, Lieutenant? Yes, sir. Um... The lieutenant looks around the room and notices a stack of campaign posters, each graphic about three feet wide by four feet tall. The candidate's strong, determined face above the red-lettered slogan, Hayward, his own man. The detective gets up and grabs one of the campaign posters. Could I write on this? Hayward nods the affirmative. Yes. I don't mean on the picture. I mean on the back. Anything you want. Columbo flips it around, exposing a plain white backside. You got plenty. I just hate the waste on it. The detective stands the cardboard rectangle upright on a wet bar, leaning it against the bulletin board, slightly elevated, so Nelson can see it from across the room. It's a, a family trait. Anything you want. Uh, Lieutenant, please, just get to the point. You know, my brother, he's 38, he's still got a sneeze from high school, you know. Um... Uh, See, this is embarrassing. You know, the one time I have a pencil, it turns out to be the wrong kind. Uh, could I borrow that marking pen? Certainly. The candidate grabs a felt tip marker, stands up, and handing it to Columbo, Nelson says, uh, Excuse me, Lieutenant. Don't misunderstand. You're a very nice man. I like you very much, but I would hate to have to depend upon you if I was in a hurry for something. Geez, you know, that's what my wife says. I'm sure she does. Get to the point, Lieutenant. Right. The detective walks over to his improvised whiteboard. Uh, I don't know how important this all is, but, uh, but you know, it's better to get it out. The lieutenant sketches a simple overhead diagram of Hayward's beach house and its garage, which, without a driveway, opens directly onto the small street outside. Uh, this is the uh, street in front of your garage. Here's your garage. Here's where the body was found. Columbo draws a tiny X on the driver's side of the garage, indicating Harry Stone was killed on the left side of the garage, about 10 feet from the door leading into the house. I'm not sure what it all adds up to, but uh, I think we ought to investigate. Yes, Lieutenant. Just... Now, um, according to the prevailing theory, I believe we sir, all the boys down in the department, they're convinced of this. Of the prevailing theory? Yes, sir. That the killer was waiting outside the hotel, saw Mr. Stone drive out when there was no security man around, took advantage of that opportunity, 
to follow him out to your beach house, and that's when he shot him. Now, uh, here's the thing that's been uh, troubling me, sir. Uh, Columbo draws another small X directly across the street. Did you ever throw rocks at a streetlight when you were a kid? Yes. Well, that must have been what happened. See, the kids, they broke this streetlight here. The kids broke the streetlight? Yes, sir. And uh, I just don't see how the murderer had enough light to see Mr. Stone in the dark in order to shoot him. Well, he could have used his headlights. I mean, uh, that is one answer that makes sense, doesn't it? First thing I thought is, well, you see, this street here is very narrow, 28 feet. Now, uh, oh, I went down to motor vehicles. I got some models down. Columbo briefly frisks himself. I hope I haven't forgotten him. Then, oh, here we go. Columbo removes from his pocket a 3 by 5 index card colored red to indicate the car driven by the killer. Now, you see, for me, when I can see something, it's clearer in my mind. Uh, he removes from his pocket another 3 by 5 card, this one colored blue. This is Mr. Stone in your car, sir. Which he holds up to the diagram, moving it slowly up the map to indicate Harry Stone heading north. Comes up, pulls into the garage. Peeling the back off a tiny adhesive, he sticks the blue card to the map, showing that Stone parked Nelson's four-door luxury sedan in the garage facing front in. Killer. Pavos makes a left turn to throw his headlights into the garage. He positions the killer's car directly behind the victim car. But the garage opens directly to the road. The problem is he's blocking traffic. I mean, right in the middle of a shooting, a citizen comes down here, what is he going to say? I'm in the middle of a shooting, you know? It's too chancy. Well, I mean, hired killers are crazy. Who knows what they would have done? It only takes a couple of seconds to shoot somebody. I mean, it's not like he was blocking traffic for a long time, huh? Well, it's not ideal for a quick getaway, sir. But, uh, well, maybe. But I still don't see how we could have got any light in there. You see, if he pulled up here... If the killer lit up the garage by using his car's headlights, in this unlikely scenario, Killer Red, headlights on, pulls up behind the rear bumper of Nelson's dark blue four-door luxury sedan. Now, remember, you got that big car. His beams would shine directly into the trunk of your car so that the spot where Mr. Stone was shot pointing at the X on the left side of the garage would still be in the dark. Have you actually tested this out, Lieutenant? Oh, yes, sir. We had actual cars up there. And you're trying to tell me that there's no other angle in which the second car could use its headlights to illuminate the spot where Harry Stone was killed? Yes, sir. Uh... Yeah, there, there was one other possible. You bet your life there was one. Here, excuse me. Hayward moves the red killer car slightly to the left, and in this way, Red's left headlight illuminates the left side of the garage, the kill zone where Harry was standing when he was shot. If he pulled in like this, granted his right headlight would point directly into the trunk of my car and not throw off any useful light, but the left headlight would have a clear path to illuminate the spot where Harry Stone was killed. Now tell me that's not possible. Yes, sir, it is possible. I mean, it's conceivable. But that's like catching lightning in a bottle for this car to hit that exact spot. But it is possible. Yes, sir. It is possible. Uh, it's possible. With everything happening on the left side of the garage, Nelson Hayward has just demonstrated that the second car's left headlight and its driver could have lined up with Harry Stone as he stumbled through the left side of the garage looking for a light switch. But then the shots couldn't come from the right-hand half of the garage. You see, sir, according to ballistics, the killer was in this area here. Columbo points to the far right side of the garage, near the open garage door. And the shots came in this direction. Diagonally towards the left side, hitting Harry about five feet from the car. Now, if the second car hit the mark that you suggested, the killer would have to lean out of the driver's seat and shoot from here. On the far left. The shots would come in this direction. From the killer's driver's seat. See, and that's contrary to the ballistics report. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. 
Very interesting. Mm hmm I see. You, uh, you don't think the murderer followed Harry out there and that he was, uh... Mm -hmm. Suddenly, he turns around and points an eager finger at Columbo. I thought, supposing he didn't follow him. Supposing he was already at the beach house, just waiting. Waiting for what, sir? To shoot me, Lieutenant, to take out a gun and to shoot me. With all your security around? You see, sir, if the murderer didn't follow Mr. Stone out, then how would he know that the security men wouldn't have been there? It's a good thought. I didn't think of that. Well, well now, what, uh, what do you make of all this, Lieutenant? Nothing conclusive, sir. But maybe the prevailing theory is wrong. Maybe this is not a case of mistaken identity. Maybe the murderer actually wanted to kill What Mr. are you Stone. talking about? That is absurd. Repeated threats are made of my life, and a man wearing my jacket and my hat, driving my car, pulls into my garage, and he's shot down dead. And you say that's not a case of mistaken identity. I don't believe that. I just don't believe it. I thought you'd be relieved. But I... I mean... I mean... I thought you'd be happy to know that the murderer wasn't trying to shoot you. Well, Lieutenant, it's, it's not a case of relief. It's, uh... Considering his words carefully, Hayward walks around behind his well-organized desk. It's a, it's a case of just trying to intelligently appraise exactly what happened. Hayward sits down in his leather-upholstered high-back office chair as Columbo remains standing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have to admit, if it was me, I feel relieved. And with that, Columbo leans in over his desk and offers his hand. I think I've taken up enough of your time. The two men shake, and finally, Columbo walks away. Oh. He quickly walks over to the sketch of Hayward's beach house. Let me put this back. Uh, I'd like to leave things the way I found them. Mindfully, Columbo puts the campaign posters back on the chair in the corner. Then, returning to Nelson's desk... You're marking them. He drops the marker in Nelson's outbasket, nods, and just as he's leaving, he stops at the door. You know... The detective turns around to face Nelson and says, Isn't it funny the way people react under the stress of a situation? Columbo slowly approaches Hayward's desk. I wasn't talking about you, sir. No, I was talking about Miss Johnson now. I beg your pardon? Miss Johnson. The girl that came in here to pick up an itinerary. Standing over Hayward's desk. I happened to hear that mentioned when I was sitting out there. So she came in and now she walked out without it. See, here it is, sir. You see, it's right here on your desk with her name on it. Well, we were making a number of additions to the itinerary. I suppose she forgot it. You're correct about one thing, Lieutenant. These campaigns are a lot of pressure. Lots of pressure. Sure they are, sir. The detective nods to Nelson, turns and walks out the door. Oh, there's one thing I almost forgot. Do you have another minute, sir? Certainly. It's just one other thing that bothers me. Would you mind closing the door, Lieutenant? Uh... You know, it's almost 35 miles from the hotel to your beach house. I believe so. That's if you go direct. I mean, you drive around, it could be more. Of course. Here's what bothers me, sir. I personally made the trip myself, and uh, I didn't race the motor. You know, normal speed. And I went in the evening. It was cool. And I didn't go in traffic. No stopping and stopping. So, um... Would you get to the point, Lieutenant? Yeah, it's just that, uh... Well, it took an hour and 50 minutes for the engine to cool. And, uh, Mr. Stone died, according to his watch, at 9.20. I arrived at the scene of crime 10 o'clock, 43 minutes later. When I put my hand on the engine in your car, it was cold. All the heat was gone in only 43 minutes. And your conclusion? No conclusion, sir. I just thought it was strange. Thought I'd mention it. Thank you very much. Columbo turns and walks out the door. Hayward takes a deep breath, sits back in his office chair and collects his wits. He feels Columbo closing in on him, methodically dismantling his alibi. 
thinking in terms of damage control. Hayward stands just as his office door opens. Mr. Hayward, I forgot to mention we got so involved. Uh, but I've asked to be assigned to your security detail. I just wanted you to know about it. Oh, Lieutenant, I'd hate to take you away from your other duties. I'm sure I'm adequately protected. Oh, no reflection on the guys on the job. They're first class, no. It's just that the day before the election, we considered a crucial time in terms of security. I understand. Hayward steps out from behind his desk and walks over to politely intercept Columbo at the door. Lieutenant, it'll be a comfort to know you're around. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. sir. The two men standing in the doorway, Columbo says, Can I ask you a personal question? Yeah. Nothing to do with the case. What'd you pay for the jacket? Hayward looks down at his coat. Well, I don't remember exactly. I no, not that one, sir. The other one. The other one? Just a minute. Columbo steps over to the coat rack, just a few feet outside the door. This one here just arrived. Oh, uh, $200, I think. No, just the jacket. That's the price, $200. No pants. Well, after all, it was tailor-made for me. Actually, I had uh, second thoughts about this jacket. It's, uh, it's identical to the one that Harry was wearing when, uh, when you found it. Yeah, I noticed that. Uh, where do you get a jacket like that? From my tailors, Chadwick's in Beverly Hills. Well, Lieutenant, are you uh, considering a change of wardrobe? Oh, no, no. Oh, well, every once in a while I think about getting a new coat, but there's no rush on that, sir. There's still a lot of wear in this fella. Looks very uh, functional. Thank you. Lieutenant, uh, really, if uh, if there's nothing else... Right. Uh, oh, it's just I got a special affair coming up Saturday night, and I'm in the market for a coat. I see. Thank you. Goodbye. Columbo drives to Nelson Hayward's high-end tailor, Chadwick's of Beverly Hills. Catering to the elite, the boutique service embraces all the trappings of the good life. Deep plush carpet, heavy velvet drapes, oak paneling, and European furniture made from polished mahogany, all beneath an array of crystal chandelier. There's a short, barrel-chested man in his early forties, Five foot six, two hundred pounds, a yellow measuring tape draped loosely around his neck. Rolled up at the sleeves, his dark blue shirt's open collar reveals a white t shirt beneath. On his left wrist, instead of a wristwatch, this man wears a red pincushion. From a pocket of his gray work apron, the dark haired man removes a ball pen and enters information into a leather bound business ledger. Another man speaking on the phone, clearly the proprietor. Mr. Chadwick is possibly of Mediterranean descent. Five foot eight, 185 pounds, thinning black hair. The bespectacled 50-something business owner wears a three-piece dark gray pinstripe suit, immaculate white cuffs accented by gold cufflinks, fine Italian shoes, all punctuated by a pocket watch hanging from a gold chain. Yes. Standing over his classical French desk, the well-regarded craftsman is concluding his phone call. Bon voyage. You, Mrs. Armstrong, yes, we'll see you back. Yes, but... Uh, Chadwick says to Columbo, May we assist you, sir? Uh, yeah, I'm looking for a jacket. Uh, did you have anything uh, particular in mind? Uh, yeah, but, uh, I don't see any jackets here. But naturally, our clothes are custom-made. Yeah, I understand, but I thought you would have a model, at least something that you could look at. Well, exactly. What did you have in mind? Sport jacket. Any particular material? Uh, something soft. Cashmere. It could be. Flannel. Flannel. Is that soft? Yeah, camel hair, that's nice. Soft. Is it soft? Soft, yes. Uh, any particular color? Brown. But there's many shades of brown, sir. <laughs> uh, there's uh, uh, midnight brown. Uh, light brown. Li on the light side. Uh, cream. Colombo gestures. Go on. Um, light in that area. Yes, um, uh, tan. Would you say tan? Could be in that More, area. Uh, on the tan side. A Would light brown, tan? something like between this here and this. Let me show you something. Sir. Right. Chadwick and his assistant Mario escort the detective over to a rack of several different materials and fabrics to choose from. 
This material we call Sands of Morocco. Came in last week. Delightful piece. No, no lines. No, no lines. Oh, yes, you did say... You did say light and beige. This one, sir? Right here. Uh, it's too rough. All right, let's try this one. I'm sure... This is a very good material. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Softness? Yeah, that's it. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. That's yes, it is. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, now let me ask you something. Uh, if I had a jacket made up in this material now, would that be something that would fit me? Well, sir, we have the finest tailors in all the world. No, I don't You've mean been in this whether... Here for quite... I don't mean that it would fit me. What I mean is that whether it would oh, well, uh, fit... Will it fit your personality? My style say? is what I mean. Personality right. Style. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You're guaranteed, sure? Guaranteed you would be most satisfied. Because I want to look... I'm going to an affair, you see, so... Oh, splendid, look. an affair, very nice. Uh, yeah, my wife, she's a bolting lead to having this dinner dance. It's an annual thing, you know, 1750 a couple. And I want to look good. Good wife, very well, sir. So I you think, think this will be all right? Oh, yes, quite sure. Mario? All right. Fine. All right. Assistant Mario helps Columbo off with his trench coat and extends a measuring tape across the width of the lieutenant's shoulders. <clears throat> You'll have that ready by Saturday. Yeah. Chadwick takes the measuring tape out of Mario's hands and begins rolling up the valuable fabric. Well, sir, I, uh, I'm afraid that is one of the things we cannot do. No, let me see. Our customers are required to allow us at least, at least ten days following first fitting. Ten Mario, days? Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Oh, it's ten days? Yes. Oh. Well, look, I, I, I was kind of afraid of that, but, uh... I'll tell you who sent me over here, uh, a friend of mine, Mr. Nelson Hayward. He gave me your name. So I thought that maybe you could give me a, a rush job like you gave him because he told me he had one delivered just like that today. I saw it. Mr. Hayward, you did see Mr. Nelson Hayward? Yeah. Mario, do you... oh, yes, I, I, I do recall, yes, that uh, delivery was made today. Oh, yes, I'm quite sure. Uh, but as I recall... Chadwick walks over to his French desk and opens a document box. The garment that was ordered to be first fitted for Mr. Hayward was on the... Um... He pokes his fingers around briefly, then produces a small card he shows to Columbo. On the 16th. Oh. Well, that long, huh? May I see that? Yes. Well, or... ten days. Right. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, that's a problem, isn't it? There is Saturday night. Uh, uh, perhaps, sir, may I suggest uh, department stores? Right. Thank you very much. Right. According to Harry Stone's appointment calendar, Nelson Hayward was originally scheduled to attend the grand opening of the Beach Cities Community Recreation Center. This morning, however, just after Colombo left Nelson's campaign office, Hayward's secretary, Helen, RSVP'd, saying, regrettably, Mr. Hayward will not be able to attend today's opening ceremony. However, Vicki, an active board member of its main sponsor, the California Human Relations Society, wouldn't miss it for the world. Thank you, thank you. It is with a real pleasure that we dedicate this community recreation center. The California Human Relations Society can be proud of its achievement in helping maintain and create new social and recreational facilities such as this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very nice. Shortly after Vicky's speech, Hello. right on schedule, free cake and coffee are being served outside in front of the newly dedicated Community Recreation Center. Surrounded by city council members, architects, and philanthropists, the detective wearing his four-year-old raincoat is about as subtle as a cockroach walking across a white rug. After a few minutes mingling, Columbo spots the woman he's come to speak with. She stands behind a fold-out table, cutting pieces from a large white sheet cake and serving them on small plates as people mill about. Wearing a red and white sweater dress, Vicki Hayward's appointment secretary, Linda Johnson, averts her eyes as Columbo approaches her folding table. Ma'am? Ma'am? No, thank you very much. Ma'am, we've never officially met. I'm from the police. Lieutenant Columbo, I'm investigating Mr. Stone's murder. Oh, well, Mrs. Hayward will be through in a few minutes. Actually, I was wondering if I might have a word with you. 
Will you do this for me now? Sure. I don't know anything about the case. Excuse me. Linda turns and walks away from Columbo, who smiles easily and follows her. Miss Johnson. Miss Johnson? That's your name? Yes. You'd be surprised how helpful people on the scene can be. Let me see. Columbo reaches into his raincoat and pulls out a small notepad. You're Miss Hayward's appointment secretary. That's right. Could you tell me about the arrangements you made for Miss Hayward's surprise party the night of the murder? I didn't make the arrangements. You didn't? Mm -mm. Columbo looks stumped. That's funny. Why is that? Uh, you know, my wife's very well organized. I mean, she takes care of our social life. I work these strange hours, you see. So I just assumed that somebody as busy as Mr. Hayward would have somebody else set up these things. Well, then maybe you should ask Mr. Hayward's secretary. Excuse me. Again, she walks away from the lieutenant, and once again, Columbo follows her. I did ask her. She didn't know anything about it. Well, what do you want me to do about it? Is Mr. Hayward good about these things? Birthday parties, sentimental occasions? Well, I don't know Mr. Hayward that well, but I understand that he is quite thoughtful and considerate. Could Mr. Hayward have made these arrangements? I really don't know, Lieutenant. Could Mr. Stone have made those arrangements? Well, what difference does it make? I don't know, Lieutenant. No difference. By itself. But if I could find out who made the arrangements, then I wouldn't be so troubled by this other thing. What thing? The fact that Mr. Stone never knew anything about a party. Mr. Stone didn't know there was a party? Oh, ma'am. How do you know that, Lieutenant? I checked his appointments, Cap. Well, maybe it was just an oversight. The detective looks down at his notepad. Mr. Stone was very efficient, and my notes say that from the start of the campaign till now, he kept a detailed record of Mr. Hayward's schedule, knew where to reach him every hour, night or day. Not one word about the party. But they weren't close socially. Why is that? A uh, different kind of men. In what way? Mr. Stone was rather crude, rather aggressive. You knew Mr. Stone very well? No, not really. I was just wondering who hired him. Um, actually, Mr. Hayward hired me. I was doing some, uh, volunteer work during the primary. I can understand that. He's a very attractive man. Yes, I like him, too. I like him for what he represents. He's a man of great courage and integrity. Well, I'm sure that's what attracted you to him as a candidate. May I say this? I think you're a wonderful girl. And I think Mr. Hayward is, is very lucky to have someone like you supporting him. Thank you very much. His business complete, the detective smiles at Linda and walks back to his car. Another warm day, and Columbo's glad he thought to park under a shady tree. He reaches under the passenger seat and takes out a AAA road map. Eyeballing it, Columbo estimates he's currently about three miles from the original crime scene. He leaves the community recreation center and drives over to Hayward's beach house. He briefly parks in front of the garage, digs around in his glove box, pulls out his trusty stopwatch, and resets it to zero. He starts the timer and drives north on Pacific Coast Highway for exactly three minutes. At a safe location, the detective pulls over, checks his stopwatch and his odometer, then writes in his notepad. When there's a break in traffic, he makes a U-turn and drives back down to Hayward's beach house. There are no local roads going east or inland, and he's already gone north, so the only other direction is south. Columbo resets his stopwatch, starts the timer, drives south for exactly three minutes, and pulls over at the roadside. At this point, he's down to a quarter tank of gas, but there's a gas station a few miles further down the road, and the local terrain has provided all the information he needs. He continues south and, about five minutes later, pulls into the gas station's self-serve lane and gets five dollars of diesel. His mind focused on the case. Columbo overshoots the five dollar point and stops the pump at 525. But the problem isn't just 25 cents. Looking through his wallet and patting himself down, the lieutenant realizes he has no cash. He grabs his checkbook from inside the glove box, 
then walks inside to pay for the gas. Inside the customer area, there's a cheap couch, a coat machine, and a payphone right next to the cashier's window. Manning the cashier's desk is a 25-year-old white guy with shoulder-length blonde hair. Reading the mechanic's name tag, Columbo sees Mike as a surfer kind of guy. Probably hits the waves as soon as he finishes his shift. Mike's light blue worker shirt rolled up at the sleeves and, as would be expected, everything about the mechanic is speckled with light stains of oil. A similarly dressed black guy in the garage, straining with all his might, with something beneath the hood of a yellow two-door Plymouth Duster. Columbo walks up to the window. I'll be, uh, 525. Respectfully, Columbo explains his predicament, not having any cash, and apologizes for his oversight. He asks Mike... You take a check? You haven't got a credit card? Uh, I'm from the uh, police. Columbo shows Mike his badge. Lieutenant Columbo, uh... Mike looks carefully at the badge. Then he looks Columbo over. Another look at the badge. What are you, uh, undercover or something? No, uh, I'm underpaid. What about the check? Would you take one? Yeah, sure. I'll take a check. Okay. Columbo gives Mike the check and lays his badge and ID on the counter, open face, so Mike can copy down whatever information he needs. The two men exchange a friendly nod, and the transaction is complete. Columbo gestures to the payphone and asks if that's the only public payphone here at the station. Mike confirms, yes, that's the only public payphone they've got. Inside, only during business hours. You investigating that murder last week up the beach? Yeah. My luck. One night we have a little excitement, and I miss it. What do you mean? Wednesday night we ran out of gas. Closed at 8 o'clock. Hello. Columbo smiles. Well, I'll be a son of a gun. A few weeks ago, Harry Stone contracted a film crew to shoot a last-minute 30-second TV spot called Hayward on Crime. According to Stone's appointment calendar, the film crew is scheduled to begin setting up today at 1 p.m. at Hayward's home address. Columbo puts the appointment calendar into a large manila envelope and puts the envelope into a box in the back of his car. He starts up his engine and makes a beeline to Hayward's sprawling two-story mansion. About 30 minutes later, at his home in West L.A., Nelson is in his upstairs office coordinating with the contracted TV crew and members of his press team. Vicki Hayward circulates around the house, making sure everyone is well-fed and knows where everything is. Satisfied everyone's taken care of, Vicki fixes herself a drink. Ever alert for the slightest deviations from the norm, Sergeant Vernon of Hayward's security detail stands by, nonchalantly studying the various specialists as they break out their arsenal of camera and TV equipment. Surrounded by his group of media consultants, Nelson Hayward and the half-dozen men descend the grand staircase. At the foot of the stairs, the candidate for Senate looks through an open door and spots his wife's appointment secretary, Linda Johnson. Mr. Hayward. Okay. Good to see you. Oh, excuse me a minute, gentlemen. Nelson separates from the group and walks over to where Linda is standing. The room smells of books and cigars. Leaving the door open, the two achieve privacy by standing behind a corner and lowering their voices. That policeman who was at campaign headquarters this morning, mm -hmm. he showed up at the dedication this afternoon. What did he want? Nelson, he makes me nervous. What did he want? He wanted to know why Harry Stone didn't know about your wife's surprise party. What does it mean? Nothing. I mean, just trying to make a name for himself, darling. Now, don't... Don't get nervous. The important thing is that you don't get upset. Don't let him get to you. Okay. Nelson gives Linda a look of thumbs-up confidence, and Linda looks like she's about to be sick. Nelson walks out of the library and returns to his entourage. Gentlemen. Oh, Mr. Hayward? Linda nods toward the staircase, and Hayward follows her gaze, looking up to see Lieutenant Columbo climbing the stairs, carrying a bulky cardboard box under his arm. What is it you want, Lieutenant? At the top of the staircase, Columbo stops, turns around, and smiles at Hayward. Oh, nothing, sir. I'm just looking for the head security guy. They, they told me he was up here. I think I'm working that 8 o'clock shift. I can't wait to get started. Uh, I last saw him in the kitchen. Oh. 
Oh, thank you very much. Columbo turns around and starts walking back down the staircase, and Hayward and his staffers continue on their original heading. About halfway down the stairs, the lieutenant says, Oh, oh sir. Listen, a couple of things came up that I want to discuss with you, but I don't want to burden you now because I can see you got a lot on your mind. Well, well quite to the contrary. There's no time like the present. As Columbo walks down the stairs, Nelson approaches, and the two men meet each other at the foot of the staircase. What can I do for you? Hey, uh, why don't you gentlemen go on out and wait in the patio? I'll be right there. Oh, the media consultants head out to the backyard oh, as Hayward and Columbo TV. continue not speaking. Not at all. Now you got this TV thing on your no, 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 no. Let's understand something, Lieutenant. You see, you think I'm reluctant to talk to you, but you're wrong. I will talk to you as often as you want, for as long as you want, about anything you want. Oh. Oh, fine. Well, uh... I'll tell you one of the things that's bothering me. Why don't we sit down? Huh? He escorts Columbo into the spacious living room. Sit down here. Make yourself comfortable. With a sweeping motion, Hayward gestures to a white wing-back chair. Thank you very much. Still wearing his raincoat, Columbo takes a seat, holding his cardboard box on his lap. Uh, one of the things that's bothering me. Would you like a drink? I'll fix your drink. No, thanks very much. No. Uh, the, uh... You make me feel so important, I forgot what I was going to say. Um... Hayward sits on the arm of a couch, so he's facing the detective. Oh, well, listen, let me start with how much I like your jacket. I really love it. Columbo puts down his box and stands up. Do you mind? He leans in close and feels the material of Hayward's jacket lapel. Soft as butter. Enjoying Columbo's approval, Nelson smiles proudly. Camel's hair. Would you believe it? The first thing I did this morning when I left the campaign headquarters, I run right over to your tailors. I'm sure he was delighted. He loves the challenge. What do you mean, sir? Uh, nothing. It's a small joke. Oh, you mean about fitting me? I'm not hard to fit. No, just the legs. Now, something goes funny in here with the legs, but, uh... Ah, oh, jackets, I pick them right off the rack. They fit like a glove. I didn't go to the guy for a good fit. No, sir. No, I went for the material. And you know what? And uh, this is the thing that bothers me, is that uh, it takes this guy 10 days to make a jacket. And you need one by? Saturday. Too bad. But that's not what bothers me. No, my problem is... Lieutenant, I'm going to make myself a drink. You sure I can't fix you one? Nelson stands up and disappears around the corner. No. You were saying your problem is? Yes. Columbo follows him into the office. I was saying that my problem is... The detective walks up to the wet bar where Hayward is pouring himself a drink. The jacket that you're wearing was delivered today, which would mean that you would have to order it ten days ago. But the one that you gave to Mr. Stone was only ruined four days ago when he got shot, and... Uh, I just don't understand how you would know six days in advance that you would need a new jacket. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Hayward. Uh, the director would like to check some camera angles. Nelson raises a hand, shows the man his palm. Not now. And the production assistant leaves the room. Lieutenant, did you happen to examine the jacket, the old one? Uh, me personally? No, sir. Because if you had taken the trouble to examine it, you'd have found that the cuffs had begun to fray, and there was a little cigarette burn in the left sleeve. That's why, ten days ago, I ordered a new jacket. Uh, what was it you wanted? The director would like to see you, please. Have I satisfied you about the jacket? Uh, yes, sir. All right, if we walk and talk, do you mind? No. Hayward downs his drink, and the two men make their way out to the backyard, where the camera crew is waiting. Well, uh, this other thing really troubles me, sir. Just a minute, I don't want to forget this. Columbo quickly returns to the white wingback chair where he had been sitting and picks up his cardboard box. Yes, this other thing is a genuine puzzle. I don't see any answer to this. Well, maybe I can help you. Nelson walks, not waiting for the detective. Let's hope so, sir. For your sake or mine. Columbo hurries to keep up with Hayward 
and the two men walk out onto the bucolic back patio. The wind chimes were undoubtedly Vicky's idea, and Hayward's backyard looks like the cover of a gardening magazine. Another production assistant intercepts Hayward and holds up a small mirror at face level. Flashing his pearlies at the mirror, the candidate for Senate checks his tie, jacket, and hair, all of which are precise. In good humor, sir. I like to win. Oh. Well, as I was saying, uh, I don't see any answer here, sir. Uh, I went out to your beach house this afternoon. I pulled out of your garage and I roared down the street at 70 miles an hour and after three minutes I stopped and there was nothing there. No bar, no restaurant, no gas station, not even a private house, nothing. Just a field, highway and birds. What were you looking for? A phone, sir. A phone? Yes, sir. Mr. Stone's broken watch fixed the time of death at 9.20. The killer's phone call came into the police at exactly 9.23. Where did the killer call from? That's what I can't answer. The closest public phone is seven minutes away in a gasoline station. Nelson puts a consoling arm around his guest's shoulder and begins walking the detective away from the camera crew. Beats me, sir. And I've considered every possibility. You're sure? As far as I know, yes. Nelson stops, turns, and with a condescending smile, he says to Columbo, Tell me something, Lieutenant. Did you know, did you know that Harry Stone always set his watch five minutes fast so he'd never be late for an appointment? Did you know that? No, sir, I didn't. Everybody else knew that. Instead of the time of death being 9.20, that it fixed it at 9.15. Now you say it takes him seven minutes to get to the gas station. Isn't that what you said? 9.15 and 7 gives you 9.22. Plenty of time to get out change, light a cigarette, and make a telephone call. Does that answer your question? No, sir. The station ran out of gas, closed early, 8 o'clock. Nelson looks like he's just been punched in the face. Mr. Hayward, can we have you now for a voice test, please? I think we held them up long enough. We'd talk later. His mind racing, Hayward buttons his camel hair sport coat and slowly, thoughtfully, heads back over to the film crew. Just as he gets to the large TV camera, Hayward turns and calls back to Columbo. What about the house phone? The murderer could have telephoned from the beach house. My keys to my house were right with the car keys. The call to the police came in downtown, sir, from your beach house. That's a toll call. I checked the telephone company. No record of a call. Defaulting to his victory smile, Hayward gives Columbo an attaboy nod of approval. Very good, detective. The TV director says to Hayward, Want to step this way, Mr. Hayward? We'll give you some marks over here. Yeah. Right, here's your ending mark. Stepping in front of the camera. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you want to... Uh, Nelson complies with the director's the prompts. Do you want to discover me here right then away? suddenly... I presume that the pay telephone in the gas station was inside. Inside, sir. Yeah, we'll have you walk right into the camera. It'll make Hayward it turns his focus back to the director. Yeah, sure. Fine, fine. Columbo notices Vicki Hayward standing back, proudly watching her husband from the sidelines. Okay, that's Wearing a backless green summer dress, Vicki holds a flower and alternates hands, shielding her eyes from the sun. Columbo puts his cardboard box down on a nearby patio table and casually sidles up to Mrs. Hayward. For a moment, two stand near each other, quietly watching the shoot. Then Columbo breaks the ice. Okay. Afternoon. Okay, I'll get this. She smiles warmly. Right there. Good. Good afternoon. That's out of picture, isn't it, boy? Do you have a minute? Uh, uh, we'd like to have you step back here. Yes. Okay. Just to give you a lot of room. How long did you know Mr. Stone? Oh, a long time. Why? Standing in front of the camera, Hayward watches curiously as Columbo talks with his wife. Did he always wear those clothes? <laughs> what clothes? Columbo gestures, follow me, and leads Vicky to his cardboard box at the other table. He opens the flaps and removes a pair of stitched, full-grain leather work shoes, men's size 11. 
These are his shoes. Heavy. Look at the soles on them. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. From a distance, okay. Hayward watches anxiously as Columbo and Vicky handle the personal items of the deceased, Harry Stone. Okay. Well, that was Harry. He wasn't very stylish. No, no Italian loafers for him. Yeah, if he wore it, it was durable. If it was nothing else, it was durable. You know, that's what struck me. It's the same thing with his suit. Columbo puts the shoes back in the box and pulls out Harry's sport coat and slacks. I checked with the salesman, and the salesman said that's how they sell these things. I mean, that's their main feature. They never wear out. Well, that's Harry. Tapers rolling. All right, everybody, quiet, please. This will be a take. Reiterating the director's quiet Every command, campaign. affectionately, Vicky pats Take Columbo's one. shoulder and gently shushes him with a finger to her lips. The two turn to watch Nelson speak to the camera. Good afternoon, I'm Nelson Hayward. One of the major concerns in our nation and in this state... But now Vicky's curious. She whispers to Columbo... Why do you ask? I have... Oh, it just bothered me. The two turn away from the shoot and lower their voices. Because his watch doesn't match with his clothes. Good afternoon, I'm Nelson. <laughs> Come again. Here's his watch. With their backs turned, they cannot see the director raising his hand, signaling quiet. See, it's a skinny little thing. It's easy to break. Don't mix with the shoes, oil and water. You follow my meaning? You know you're right, because... Shh. You better get out of here before we both get in trouble. Columbo whispers, we better get out of here before we both get in trouble. Wordlessly, Vicky gestures walking fingers and points to a blue and white umbrella table farther away from the film shoot at the side of the swimming pool. The detective nods, pointing at the same blue and white umbrella table. If I'm elected to the United States, Meanwhile, Senate, Nelson recites his lines in front of the camera. The, the words are correct, nation, but Nelson's attention drifts as he watches his wife I'm escort Nelson Columbo, Hayward. carrying One his cardboard box, to the far side of their backyard. Crime on the streets today is a brutal reality. And it's not going to stop until the criminal no longer... The detective and the millionaire's wife convene at the umbrella table near the swimming pool. Standing in the shade of the umbrella, Vicky watches with interest as Columbo puts his box down on the table. Do you know that I actually went to a jewelry store? And I actually brought these shoes and this suit with me. Now I said to the salesman, I said, look, these are very durable items. Now suppose the owner of these items wanted the same quality in his watch that he had in his shoes. What kind of a watch would he buy? You know the guy had an answer? Well, what did he say? I got it right here. The detective reaches into his raincoat and pulls out a large stainless steel wristwatch, a common 20th century timepiece, but it looks like armor plating worn by some Roman centurion. Look at this watch. You won't believe this. Columbo pulls back and strikes it hard against the umbrella pole. Embarrassed but giggling, Vicky look looks around right hoping no one heard. You can't break I want the decent law by the I don't care what you do. He's still picking. He hands the watch to Vicky, who holds it to her ear and nods. She lowers it from her ear and just looks at it for a moment. I don't know what all this means, Lieutenant, but I agree with you. I think Harry would buy that kind of a watch. Not that other funny little thing. You do? Yeah. Miss Hayward, I'm going to ask you a question now. I'm afraid it's going to be unsettling, but I'm going to ask it anyhow. Go ahead. Meanwhile, as he reads through his lines in front of the camera, Nelson Hayward is increasingly distracted as he watches his wife walk Columbo out to his car. Law-abiding citizen of this country to be able to walk the streets without fear. This is Nelson Hayward. I would appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do it again, boys. It was very good, Mr. Hayward, but uh, you kind of lost concentration in this in the middle there. Uh, we're looking off in okay. the direction of your wife. All right, all right, let's do it again. Right away. A right. mortified Vicki Hayward comes running back from the driveway, stops at the blue and white umbrella table, and frantically waves at Nelson, gesturing he should come back to her now. But before he can respond, Hayward is nearly tackled by an excited political aide bearing good yes. news. Nelson, Nelson, we just got a break. One of the news boys leaked Davis's rebuttal questions to us. Okay. They're dynamite. 
but Nelson's focus is locked on his wife. Noticing Columbo's car is gone, Nelson walks quickly across the yard to the umbrella table where his panic-stricken wife is standing. Yes, Doctor. The detective, he wanted to know if the night of the party, if you left the room between 9.15 and 9.30. Why did he want to know that? I don't know what he's up to, darling. Just Daddy, ignore him. Honey, he is, he is a homicide detective. I know. He's not just don't, an ordinary... Don't let him upset you, Sean. Okay, don't, don't but he wanted to know if, if you got along with Harry. I don't... And, and, and pay he no attention to him, darling. You're he getting upset. He said it was... Shh. Look, wait a minute. He said it wasn't a political murder. That whoever killed Harry... Listen, you know, darling, was, was, I'm at the peak of a political... I'm under enormous pressure. Someone is trying to kill me. Now, that is a fact, isn't it? I don't know what the police are up to. Harry was killed driving my car in my clothes and in my garage. Do I have to get gunned down in the streets before anybody believes it? Now, just, it's, it, it, it's difficult enough, darling. Don't make it any tougher than it is, huh? Okay. A confused and disoriented Vicki Hayward, in the face of damning evidence, collapses into Nelson's arms as she seeks reason and safety in her husband's familiar embrace. It's gonna be all right, baby. I'll make it all right. I'll make it all right. The murderer comforts his frightened wife. Later that night, long after the media and PR consultants have departed, Vicky takes a much needed tranquilizer and turns in for the night. Downstairs in the living room, Nelson Hayward is very much awake as he sits on the couch reading a newspaper in front of a roaring fire. But the wealthy politician's not checking his stock portfolio, nor even his standing in the race for Senate. His fingerprints shrouded by disposable white cotton gloves, Nelson uses a pair of scissors to cut select words out of the paper. Wearing gloves, adhesive tape is tricky business but Nelson manages to stick eight individual words to a sheet of gray craft paper. His message reads, Hayward, drop out, you live. Win, you die. He slides the completed death threat into a manila envelope, which he puts in his briefcase. He sweeps up all the extra little paper clippings, wraps everything into the old newspaper, and puts it in the fire. He takes off his white gloves and throws them in the fire as well. The next morning, special election day, news reporter Larry Burrell and his TV crew are reporting from Hayward Campaign Headquarters in the converted Grand Ballroom of the five-star Western Grand Adventure Luxury Hotel. This is Larry Burrell at the headquarters of Nelson Hayward, candidate for the special election for United States Senator. The polls opened at 7 o'clock this morning here in Los Angeles. And Registrar of Voters Roger Neufeld is predicting a 72% voter turnout, which is exceptionally high for an off-year election. At this exact moment, acts of deceit are hidden behind the office door marked Private Nelson Hayward. Twenty minutes earlier, the senatorial candidate told his secretary Helen he is not to be disturbed under any circumstances. Linda Johnson, his wife Vicky's appointment secretary, will be coming by to get his signature on three travel receipts. If she shows up early, please ask Miss Johnson to wait until Hayward calls for her. Now in the sanctuary of his private office, Nelson opens the safe, takes out his brown leather briefcase, lays it on the desk and opens it. He reaches into the file divider and takes out his 38 caliber revolver. He makes sure the weapon is fully loaded, safety on. He checks the silencer, ensuring a snug fit, then carries the weapon over to the coat rack and carefully slides it into the left lower inside pocket of his charcoal gray overcoat. Next, he opens the manila envelope, takes out the homemade death threat, puts it in his desk lap drawer, and closes the drawer. He closes his briefcase, stores it back in the office safe, and shuts its heavy three-inch thick steel door. A quick look around the office to ensure he's not forgotten anything, he picks up the phone and rings his secretary, Helen, just outside. Send in Miss Johnson, please. Hayward walks over to the wet bar, pours himself a whiskey, and takes a drink. Good morning, darling. Linda walks in and kisses him on the cheek. That's for luck. And I could use some. Nelson puts down his drink, gives her arm a squeeze, and crosses the room. Seeing the glass of booze this early in the day, Linda furrows her brow. Is something wrong? Election day. Well, what is it? Nothing I want you to worry over, darling. 
come on, now, there is something wrong. Now, tell me, what is it, please? Nelson raises an index finger. I'll show you. He walks around behind his desk, opens the drawer, and pulls out the homemade death threat. Come and take a look at this. Linda reads the intimidating message. Hayward, drop out, you live. When, you die. Linda's stance wobbles slightly and Nelson catches her. Oh, no. Easy, darling. Oh, Nelson, before Harry was killed, there was a possibility that these were just idle threats, but not now. Where did you find it? On my desk this morning. Well, haven't you told the police yet? Oh, no. Linda, I'm scared. Well, I should think so. Linda grabs the phone, lifts the receiver to her ear, and hits an extension. Nelson oh, gently takes it from her and hangs up. The police aren't going to help. Lieutenant Colombo thinks that all the threats were fake just for sympathy and publicity. What? They're never going to believe that I didn't just plant this thing here myself. I tell you, if just somebody else would have found it. He looks at Linda and sees the gears turning. The police will never believe me. The two look each other in the eye. All right, I found it. No, no, no. no. I it's found best it just you... now. No, it's best you stay out of it. Nelson, I'm not going to stand here and watch you murdered like Harry. This time when Linda picks up the phone, Nelson does not stop her. Ask Sergeant Vernon to come in here, please. Later that afternoon, returning to his two-room suite on the sixth floor of the Western Grand Adventure Luxury Hotel, Nelson Hayward carries his charcoal gray overcoat while being followed by a throng of reporters and photographers. Mr. Hayward, Mr. Hayward one question. Oh, sorry, guys, no more speeches. Now it's up to the people. Well, it's, it's not political, sir. It's the latest threat on your life. Any, any comment on that? Well, of course, I'm concerned. LAPD uniformed officers posted every 20 feet stand alert amid alleged death threats against Hayward. Detective Sergeant Vernon walks in front of Hayward, politely bulldozing their way through the inquisitive mob of journalists. Following behind Hayward's entourage, Vernon's partner, Sergeant Rojas, visually scans everyone within arm's reach of the candidate. Walking past his private bedroom, room 617, Hayward arrives at room 615, where he's greeted by a tall and imposing police officer, Reginald Murphy, speaking to the reporter. Hayward nods toward Murphy. But uh, happily, I'm, I'm well guarded, Matt. Do you have any special plans for today? Well, just to hang around the suite for a few hours. Then later on, Mrs. Hayward and I are going out and vote, of course. I'm not that confident. So if I only win by two votes, you'll know who those were. <laughs> With his election-winning smile, Hayward disappears into his suite, closing the door behind him. Sergeant Vernon says to Detective Rojas, Where's Colombo? He's in the press room. Vernon walks 10 feet down the hall to suite 616, where the posted uniform opens the door for him. The barrel-chested detective enters the press room, where he sees four men wearing coats and ties, sitting around a table playing cards in a cloud of nicotine. He sees Lieutenant Colombo catnapping on a couch next to the desk in the corner. Stretched out head to toe with a newspaper covering his face, Colombo rests his head on the arm of the couch, the arm nearest the desk. Lieutenant? Yeah. Lieutenant? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Hayward's back in his suite, sir. From beneath the newspaper, Columbo waves a casual hand, acknowledging his fellow officer. Vernon returns the wave and walks out, closing the door behind him. Oh, Sergeant. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Listen, uh, you let me know if Mr. Hayward is ever alone. Oh, no. We won't leave him alone, sir. No, I mean if he goes to the bathroom, you know, to, to take a shower or something. All right. Right, sir. Each man nods his confirmation to the other. Columbo gets back to his catnap, and Vernon returns to suite 615 down the hall. Standing guard at the door, Officer Murphy reports to Sergeant Vernon there's been no visitors nor suspicious activity of any kind in the past hour. Sergeant Vernon taps Murph on the arm. Good job. Sergeant Vernon enters the room to see Nelson Hayward sitting on the couch, still holding his charcoal gray overcoat, his eyes riveted, understandably, to the TV news election coverage. Sitting at a desk with his back to the wall, Sergeant Rojas stands up when he sees his partner. Not wanting to disturb Hayward, Sergeants Vernon and Rojas quietly search both rooms of the suite, checking for suspicious or dangerous objects. The two detectives look behind pictures, under the couch, a quick glance inside the refrigerators, a more thorough inspection of the closets and the bathrooms. 
Meanwhile, out in the hallway, the elevator door is open and Linda Johnson steps out wearing her long sleeve white dress and carrying Hayward's brown leather briefcase. Approaching Suite 615, she's stopped by Police Officer Reginald Murphy. What's in the case, please, ma'am? Uh, Mr. Hayward asked me to bring it from his office. Is it locked? I don't know. Would you try it, please? I'll have to take a look into it. Mr. Hayward's orders, ma'am. Everything and everybody coming into the suite has to be searched. Officer Murphy calls to a female officer. Miss Dodds. I'm sorry. Perfectly all right. I'm glad they're taking so much precaution. <laughs> officer Cynthia Dawes walks Linda into a private room where she's patted down for weapons, or as some cops call it, a terry frisk. According uh, to the most... Meanwhile, behind the door marked 615, the two detectives are doing their search as Nelson Hayward sits watching the TV. The LAPD officer Murphy enters carrying a brown leather briefcase. So far, Mr. Hayward, a lady brought this from your office. The uniformed officer crosses the room, handing Hayward his briefcase. She's being searched. Ms. Johnson? Sergeant Vernon reminds Hayward. No exceptions, Mr. Hayward. Now you, you agree. Okay, okay. Both candidates register strong. Hayward gestures to the connecting door to his bedroom in the next room. Do you, uh, you guys mind if I go in there and make a few private phone calls? Sergeant Vernon leads the way as Hayward carries his overcoat and briefcase. Entering the adjoining room, Hayward puts his personal items down on the bed, and Sergeant Vernon steps out onto the patio, checking for ladders, rope, scaffolding, or any other means, however unlikely, by which an intruder might gain access from this high up. He looks out over the neighboring buildings. He looks down onto the busy street six stories below. And for just a split second, Vernon wonders what it would be like to fall from this dizzying height. One last look around, and seeing nothing unusual, the detective goes back inside room 617. Factor in this election. Well, there's no way anybody can get out there from the next suite, but I wish you'd stay inside, sir. Surely. We have police people in... Uh, the loaded gun is still in Nelson's charcoal gray overcoat, which is on the bed about ten inches from his open briefcase. Hayward busies himself shuffling through various documents when, without warning, Vernon picks up the overcoat. Keeping his cool, the candidate focuses on the page he's holding as Vernon carries the coat to the closet. Nelson holds his breath as his bodyguard casually hangs up the overcoat and closes the closet door. Nelson exhales. Vernon opens the front door leading out to the hallway, waves a hand to the cop in the hall, closes the door, locks the doorknob and the deadbolt. All secure, sir. Sergeant Vernon leaves the room the same way he came in, through the inside connecting door. Hayward pauses for a moment. Then... He locks the connecting door, goes to the closet, and pulls out his charcoal gray overcoat. At this moment in the suite next door, Sergeant Vernon calls the press room. Hello. Yep. Lieutenant. Sergeant Vernon. Waking up on the couch, Columbo moves aside the newspaper and holds the phone to his ear. Yeah. The candidate's in his bedroom alone. He had some personal calls to make. Right. Columbo hangs up the desk phone and rests his head on the arm of the couch. Groggy, he watches the little light go out as Vernon hangs up in the room across the hall. Meanwhile, now completely alone in his private bedroom, Hayward carries his 38 caliber revolver out to the patio. He closes the sliding glass door, careful not to lock himself out. Nelson looks at the room's work desk and aims at a point just above the desk phone. Bullet hole to the glass, then lodged in the wall, plain as day, right where his head would have been. Back inside the room, Hayward closes the floor-length velvet drapes to hide the bullet hole in the glass. Then he makes a beeline over to the work desk to assess his marksmanship. Bingo! The bullet lodged in the drywall, right where his head might have been. Nelson sticks his finger in the hole, still warm to the touch. Pleased with his accuracy, he moves the high back chair against the wall to cover the bullet hole. Next, he stows the deadly weapon inside his brown leather briefcase, closes it, and spins its combination dials on both sides. Nelson's work here complete. He leaves his charcoal gray overcoat on the bed, 
and exits his bedroom through the inside connecting door. As he returns to the adjoining room, 615, Nelson sees Linda Johnson, his wife's secretary, sitting on the couch with her back to him, the two detectives standing near each door. Davis and Hayward were considered by most pollsters. Miss Johnson! To be running he gestures to the briefcase, but continues holding it. Would you be good enough to take this to the office and lock it in the safe? Oh, yes. Linda stands up from the couch as she collects her purse and jacket. I'm sorry about that search before. I'm not. Grinning like a Cheshire cat, he rests his left hand on her back, and with his right hand he carries the briefcase as he sees her to the door. You will uh, join us, sir. Nelson opens the front door. To his wife, Mrs. Hayward enters the room, and the three look at each other awkwardly. Hello, Linda. Hello. At a loss for words, Nelson pushes the briefcase at Linda Johnson. Oh, Mrs. Hayward, will you be unneeding me anymore this afternoon? No. I'm sure that Nelson will. Thank you. Nelson bids Linda goodbye, closes the door, and turns to face his wife. I assume we'll be uh, voting together. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, darling. Right now. This time, when Sergeant Vernon dials extension 616, the press room is nearly empty, except for the one person laying on the couch focused on the phone. Colombo, we're just leaving with a candidate and his wife to vote. A few minutes later, the door to 617 opens, and Sergeant Vernon leads as Nelson and Vicki Hayward are followed by an excited mob of reporters, friends, police, aides, and other supporters. As the group heads for the elevator lobby, the door to room 616, the press room, opens, and Columbo yells to wish Hayward good luck. Good luck, sir! Later that evening, as state and federal officials tally the votes, the election party is in full swing on the entire sixth floor of the Western Grand Adventure Luxury Hotel, as volunteers and staffers finally let their hair down and apply a more literal meaning to the term political party. With the exception of Hayward's private bedroom, all rooms on the sixth floor are available and open. Nelson Hayward works the room, schmoozing, shaking hands, and showing his gratitude to his happy friends and advisors. Ever vigilant, Sergeants Vernon and Rojas, as well as six uniformed cops, circulate the floor, watching for suspicious or threatening activity. Vicki Hayward is enjoying a drink with some friends. Linda Johnson laughs with one of the other volunteers. From out in the hallway, Officer Murphy opens the door for Lucy Travis, one of Vicki's best friends from college. I'm sorry about the search, man. Mind it so much, I'd have been you instead of her. Victoria! Hello! What a wonderful, wonderful day. We'll see you in that. Hi, Davis 1138, Hayward 2014. Visalia, 9 precincts reporting. Davis 411, Hayward 505. Humboldt with uh, 4 precincts reporting. With all the clowning and merriment, Nelson Hayward makes sure he goes unnoticed as he casually disappears into his private bedroom, room 617. After closing the door, he pulls the high back office chair away from the wall to expose the small black gunshot he made three hours ago. He opens the floor to ceiling curtains, exposing the bullet hole in the sliding glass door. He steps out onto the patio, takes a firecracker out of his pocket, and carefully lights it while shielding it from the breeze of the sixth floor balcony. Out in the hallway, everyone panics, and most of the partiers are pretty sure the gunshot came from room 617. Guns drawn, safety's off. Sergeants Vernon and Rojas rush into Hayward's private bedroom while uniformed cops seal the exits and maintain order. Vicky is already at her husband's side and fails to notice when Linda Johnson walks in behind her. As the pandemonium begins to subside, Hayward babbles his fraudulent tale to anyone who will listen. Currently, Vicky, Linda, and two other guests. Just then, Sergeant Vernon walks in from the other room. You don't believe anybody else was in this room? 
Oh, please, sir, I didn't mean to imply That's exactly what you're implying. A furious Nelson Hayward stands up and challenges Sergeant Vernon. I'm getting sick and tired of police innuendos. I mean, if I fired the shot, wouldn't there still be a gun here in the room? Or, or on me? Or found down on the street below? Why don't you search for it? Just search for it! Detective Columbo makes his way through the confused mob of party guests. right now with me. Here, here. All my friends here, my wife, everybody else in the suite. Come on. Let the lieutenant come It's me, Sergeant. I'm sorry. Dennis, get in here. Lieutenant, somebody just took a shot at Mr. Hayward. Yeah, I heard. Now, I told Rojas to forget about surrounding the building because the guy that fired that shot is still in this room. What? What's he talking about? It's all right. It's all right, everybody. Huh? He means me. You? Isn't that right? Yes, sir. It's just as I figured. That's exactly what I thought you'd say. I fired the shot. Is that it? Columbo looks down regretfully while nodding his head, yes. Lieutenant Colombo, was there a gun in this room? I wouldn't say so, sir, no. I mean, would you concede there's no gun in the room? Yes, sir. All right. Let me show you something. Hayward crosses the room and points to the sliding glass door. Is this a bullet hole in the glass? Yes, sir. Would you say it was fired at an angle? Nelson walks over to the desk with the office phone. Calculated to hit a victim in the head here, seated at the phone in this chair? Yes, sir. And would you say that having failed to hit the intended victim, the trajectory indicates that this hole in the wall was caused by the spent bullet? Yes, sir. Would you further concede that if this bullet proves to be from the same gun that killed Harry Stone, that the same hand fired both shots? Yes, sir. Then all that remains for you is to dig the bullet out of the wall and take it to ballistics for a comparison? No, sir. I've already dug the bullet out of the wall, and ballistics has already verified that it came from the same gun. Detective Columbo reaches into the front right pocket of his raincoat and pulls out a wadded up handkerchief. Here's the bullet. Here's the ballistics report. No bullet in the wall. Bullet's right here. It's in my handkerchief. He unravels the handkerchief and takes out the bullet. Yeah, there she is. Realizing he's not handing it to her, Vicky pulls her hand back. You see, sir, this afternoon when you told Sergeant Vernon that you were going to come in here to make some private telephone calls, I was over there in the press room. Now, this room is 6.15 and the press room is 6.16. When you call from here, it lights up over there because you installed that special three-way rotary system. So I kept watching the phone for 6.15 to light up. Yeah, it's lit up now. You see that? I kept waiting for that button to light up. Vicki Hayward begins to cry and does not protest when Linda Johnson puts a comforting hand on her shoulder. Never lit up. I didn't know what the hell you were doing here. I knew you weren't making a call. And I confess I got curious. And when you and your wife, when you went to vote, I took advantage of that opportunity to come in here and look around and I found that bullet hole in the glass door, and that took me to the wall. I dug this bullet out of that wall three hours before you said that somebody fired it at you three minutes ago. You're under arrest, sir. Nelson's eyes close involuntarily. Perhaps one politician's final concession of defeat, or maybe one last attempt to shield the soul from one's own evil. Time will tell. Columbo does not dwell on such issues. Tonight he has a date. It's the annual dinner dance of Mrs. Columbo's bowling league. 1750 a couple. They want to look good. It's a very special affair. We hope you've enjoyed this audio presentation of Columbo, Candidate for Crime. For more free podcasts, visit us online at projectwasabi.com. Reporting for Project Wasabi, this is Brian Newberry. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you soon.